Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. If you were with us last week, this is a continuation of our Q&A session on COVID workplace safety. We're trying to do these regularly so that you can see and have the information that you need as an employer or an employee to know what you, what you should be doing in the workplace or what you could be doing in the workplace. So just a real quick recap, uh, what we wanna talk about today, we'll get back to our Q and A's and start picking up on where we left off on some of those. Uh, certainly we will miss some, uh, but I will give you a resource that you can use if you, we don't get to your question or you have other questions that come in regarding workplace safety for either the employer or the employee. So one of the things we wanna talk about, and we know that everybody's becoming quite familiar with this, especially with Executive Order 153 in the Mask Up Michigan campaign, that when we're talking about the workplace and we're talking about the general public, we're talking a lot about face coverings. And the reason for that is that science is telling us that if we're both wearing these masks, we can cut our potential transmission by about 70%. Now you can picture in your workplace that if you're intermingling with people or the public's coming in, that is a huge mitigation strategy to make sure that you stay safe in the workplace. So we have this great visual out there that you can use. Uh, we're trying to cut down on those aerosols and large respiratory droplets that we expel from our bodies when we talk, sing, yell, sneeze, or cough. And that is really where uh, the transmission of COVID is coming from. So while I mentioned all this uh, noise around COVID last week, you know, some of the pieces are pretty stable and that's wash your hands regularly. Don't touch your eyes, nose and mouth. Wear a face covering and try as you may to maintain that social distancing. So these are the key things that you can do. And as you see on this hierarchy of transmission risk, we get to the lowest and low spots when we're both wearing face coverings. Lowest, of course, when we can maintain that social distancing and then practically no transmission risk when we're all staying at home. We know that we're out and about and we're doing these things and that's why these face coverings are so critical. So as I mentioned, we are absolutely asking, begging, pleading and talking about masking up Michigan to make sure that we keep each other safe, that we keep our economy open. It's get open and stay open and that's the goal. What we're doing at COVID Workplace Safety is continuing to coordinate across agencies. We're having great discussions and communities all across Michigan on how we can coordinate with local businesses, local employee groups, colleges, health departments, police departments, and others to make sure that we're all doing our part. And we're developing a lot of communication tools and updating them all the time to make sure that all of us have the information we need as it pertains to workplace safety. So we have, again, posters, videos, fact sheets, industry-specific guidelines, and more at our website here, michigan.gov COVID Workplace Safety. There is a specific set of guidelines for every industry that's been named in an executive order, and most recently, uh, meat and processing plants, as well as K through 12 education, uh, were issued in executive orders, and those are up now too. We also have a lot of those posters in alternative language and some of the other information. So if you're looking for those, you'll see a, a box that says alternative language and click on that and we'll have most of these posters there for you too. Businesses can use those and certainly there's a lot of good fact sheets and other things. These are just a couple of examples of the posters we have available. We do have other versions and varieties and some social media tools that you can use. And if we don't get to your questions today or you have ongoing questions, Myosha did a great job internally of setting up a hotline that folks can use to ask questions as it relates to COVID and what needs to be happening in the workplace or what you're seeing in the workplace. And that's 855-SAFE-C19 or 855-723-3219. That'll ring directly into MyOSHA and the MyOSHA experts will answer those calls and discuss the situation you're having with you. If you're an employee and it's necessary that you file a complaint, they will work with you to get you over to the complaint filing process. If you're an employer and you're looking for ways that you can improve your workplace, they can get you over to the consultation group, which is a wonderful group within MyOSHA that will help employers across the state of Michigan identify, fix, and uh, make other changes to their workplace to enhance workplace safety. So we got a lot of great websites that you can use. These are the workplace safety site I just mentioned. The Michigan Economic Development Corporation there has a link over to places where businesses can procure PPE that they need from other Michigan manufacturers. We have a wonderful My Symptoms app that our team and friends over at the Department of Health and Human Services put together that can 
help employers meet their health screening obligations under the executive orders. This will allow you to set up an account, uh, get your employees signed on to you, and ask the series of questions that you need to ask before they come to work. You can check out the Michigan Safe Start plan at michigan.gov Michigan Safe Start and certainly check out the Mask Up Michigan campaign because there's a lot of other good information and statistics there that can help you understand why this is so critical. So we're going to move from there and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, we're going to move into from there into the question and answer period. Uh, we're a little bit earlier than we were uh, last time, so we're going to try to get through more questions as we move along. I think that as we move forward uh, next week or in the coming weeks, we're going to try to focus in perhaps on specific industries because we know there's a lot of information about bars and restaurants and retail and grocery and manufacturers and construction that we're trying to get to and we want to really be able to hone in on specific sectors so that everybody can really understand what they need to be doing what their employer should be doing and how things should look so with that i think i'm ready to jump into some q a thanks for that sean uh, my name is erica and i'm going to be moderating the q a session so for those of you who are joining us today and you have questions for Sean, make sure you submit them in the Q&A tab within the Teams event, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Uh, Sean, the first question is from Jim. If a company has customers that come in, but the door is locked and only clients that have an appointment are allowed in, do those customers have to wear a mask? So that's an interesting question, and I think it's an important one to make these distinctions, right? Because obviously, we have Executive Order 153, which requires all of us to wear face covering when we're outside our home, uh, if we're outdoors and can't maintain social distancing, or we're in an indoor public space. If you have a business operation that you're doing by appointment only, and you are controlling who is coming in, certainly that it does not create a public space. Public space being pretty much anybody can walk in at any time. So that's Executive Order 153 controlling that environment. What we're going to want to look at in this case is Executive Order 145, which sets the workplace safety requirements. And as you know, the masking requirements in 145 are different. So if now what I want you to think about in this question, though, is that somebody's letting that person in the door, somebody's bringing them somewhere, and somebody is going to be sitting with them potentially, depending on what they're doing. So are you able to maintain six feet of social distance at all times? You are required by the executive order to wear a mask if you're going to be in common hallways, common areas, certainly elevators, things like that, where while nobody may be there, they could come there. So you're gonna still need uh, to wear that face covering in that situation in certain aspects. Now, uh, we could go through a million examples, but uh, generally, you know, if you're doing by appointment only, that is great. Uh, it, but you're still going to need to think about when that mask is required when you're getting within six feet of each other and uh, per, uh, preferably you're doing a health screening with that person too before they come into your building. Perfect and I think you touched on some of this but Jim has also asked um, in regards to executive order 145 that says require face coverings in shared spaces what do they mean by shared spaces? Is an office where four people sit with no cubicle walls between them considered a shared space, uh, even if they are more than six feet apart? So that's, uh, like I mentioned, we can get to a lot of specifics. So the goal inside an office building is to maintain that six feet of social distance. Now there's a door into that place, you know, it gets really complicated. So what I would suggest to Jim is, you know, with some of these more specific questions, ring that hotline and talk with the Myosha folks because there's going to be another detail to every layer of that question. But so certainly you have an office with four people in it. They're separated out. Uh, maybe they don't need the coverings while they're sitting there, but every time they get up and walk out, they're going to be walking within six feet of the other people. Therefore, everybody's going to need to mask up. So it makes it very challenging uh, to give you a direct answer on that. But I would encourage you all when you get specific and you need to, to add details to these questions, feel free to give 855-SAFE-C19 a call and talk through them. All right, the next question we have comes from Bill. If an employee presents one or more of the CDC published COVID-19 symptoms, is processed as an employee with a suspect COVID-19 infection, 
but later receives a single negative test, should they be treated as a normal illness bypassing the COVID-19 return to work criteria? So uh, potentially, you know, the symptoms with COVID do overlap with other illnesses, right? <clears throat> if you have a sudden cough or a runny nose or a fever or something, you know, as definitely as we get to our flu season, these are going to be challenging areas that we're going to have to examine. So if you have symptoms of COVID, uh, certainly you're going to want to get out of the workplace. The employer should be trying to get you out of the workplace to make sure that if it is COVID, you're not exposing other people. If you talk with your medical provider, tell them their sim your symptoms and they say it could be COVID, uh, please go take a test and you get a test that's negative. Obviously, you're still sick, but that would indicate that you do not have the COVID virus. All right. If your office common area, uh, i.e. copy machines, coffee stations, break rooms, um, what is the frequency we should sanitize? So uh, a copier or something like that where people are going to be touching often, one of the things that employees need to be doing if you work in an office in the executive order, you're supposed to be cleaning your area twice a day. If you're using copiers or other high traffic spots where people are touching and standing and doing their thing, they're going to want to be wiping those down. It doesn't mean you have to bring in outside cleaners, but you're going to need cleaning cleaning supplies there so that they can wipe those machines down after they use them. And uh, you know, it, it, you should wipe it when you use it, similar to the gym where Everybody's supposed to wipe it down after they leave and many do. You still want to wipe it down when you get there. Similar in a break room or otherwise, you're going to want to uh, make sure you're, you're going to want to look at what's happening in your break room. You know, is it the coffee spot? You know, and if it's the coffee spot, make sure people are wiping it down and cleaning up as they go. And then certainly uh, within the executive order, there's some other cleaning requirements uh, on a daily basis too. All right. If my administration for my employer has encouraged employees who travel to other states to lie so that they don't have to self isolate, what can I do to keep myself safe as they don't wear a mask as that is only mandated in the hallways for the employees of my public service government building? I would encourage that person to contact my OSHA and talk with them about potentially filing a complaint. All right, and our next question is from Joseph Henges. For the mask order, if one side of a business building is completely open, um, i.e. a hangar with doors wide open, does that fall into the category of indoor public space? Yes. Yeah, if there's four walls, it's an indoor public space. The uh, large doors being open uh, certainly help with ventilation and otherwise. They're depending on what type of business this is, you know, certainly that one sounds like anybody can walk in at any time. Uh, obviously, that would be a public space. Um, so, yes. All right. And can staff who can't tolerate a mask wear a face shield instead? Uh, what if they truly have a medical condition that makes it impossible to wear a mask? Is a shield OK then? So, uh, what an employee should do in that situation is utilize the processes of the Americans with Disabilities Act to request an accommodation. Now, in some cases, a face shield may be the right accommodation, but what we want to stress here is that uh, the mask itself and the shield are going to have two different pr protective qualities. So in, when you read the executive order, you have to wear face covering and a mask in certain situa uh, a shield in certain situations. So you're going to need to work with your employer to identify if that's a reasonable alternative to wearing a face covering, if it's not creating a hazard for the employee, if there's another way that you can, your work can be assigned in some of those tools. So if you have a medical condition that uh, truly prevents you from wearing a face covering, uh, you're going to want to request a reasonable accommodation from your employer and work through that process because uh, while it might sound simple to say, sure, a shield will work, that, that may not be true if you're four inches away from your coworker. So uh, they're going to have to work through the process to make sure they're not creating a greater hazard for you and still mitigating the hazard for others around you. All right, the next question is from Pat. In a manufacturing environment, is there a difference between masks, face shields, or gaiters? Uh, will my OSHA see these PPE the same way? 
So in a manufacturing setting, notwithstanding the discussion we just had about uh, reasonable accommodations, but in a manufacturing setting, if you cannot maintain that six feet of social distancing, you have to be wearing a face covering, whether that's a cloth face covering or a gaiter. I, a gaiter, if, if people aren't aware, because I wasn't aware, is the thing that everybody's wearing around their neck and you just pull it up and pull it down, uh, basically like a, a t-shirt. Um, that, that would count as a face covering, but the shield is in addition to, it's not in lieu of. So if you're within, if you can't consistent, consistently maintain more than three feet of separation, the executive order is gonna have you considering that face shield. Uh, there are other things that employers gonna have to look at is that, you know, what is the type of work that's being done and does that face shield create a hazard? I know last week we talked a little bit about fogging on glasses and stuff. And certainly when you're wearing a mask, a little temporary fog that's not going to create a hazard for you. If you're getting permanent fogging, I know uh, I mentioned last week, I'm also a licensed electrician and I know you put that face shield on sometimes, it's humid and hot, that thing fogs up and you can't see anything. Um, that's creating an additional hazard. So we might have to find something different there, but it's a face covering in a plus a face shield when it's required, not in lieu of. Excellent. I'm glad you knew what Gators was. I was hoping I was saying that right. <laughs> uh, our next question is from Steve. If you have a negative test result, do you have to quarantine for 14 days? So we're working through these kinds of answers. I think that um, if you were diagnosed with COVID, a negative test result may not get you out of the quarantine period, depending on your symptoms. But in general, uh, you know, if your healthcare provider, when they clear you and say it wasn't COVID, you're you're good. But if you just kind of made this up yourself, went through the drive through testing thing, uh, there's no clarity around how that process was handled. A negative, if you just show up with a negative test, you still need to be touching base with your healthcare provider. All right, and this is another question we have in from Joseph Henges. Can you define the tor term indoor public space as used in Executive Order 2020-153? Uh, yes, uh, so public means that pretty much anybody can walk in, uh, you know, think of a gas station or retail, uh, you know, that, that kind of business where I don't need an appointment to get in there, the door's unlocked and I can just walk in. Uh, enclosed, of course, meaning it's a building, has a ceiling and four walls. It could have big doors that help with ventilation, could have giant windows that help with ventilation, but that's still gonna be an indoor space. All right, our next question. Uh, hello, I have two questions. The first is in regard to if there's a positive at a workplace. I was curious if the workplace is required to close for two weeks. I was under the impression that the workplace had to close to be disinfected. Can we bring persons back if they are negative and the workplace has been cleaned? Uh, yes, no, a workplace does not need to close for two weeks. I think uh, perhaps if you're working with local public health and that was their advice, you know, maybe that situation could come up. But in general, if they have a positive case in the workplace, they need to get that person out of the workplace talk with that person to identify who they've been near and perhaps get those people out of the workplace. They need to find out where that employee was working and shut that part down to do a deep cleaning. As soon as that deep cleaning is done, they can get that thing back open. Now, most of these cleaning type things take some time. So it's not like you walk in with a, a bottle of Windex and a, a roll of paper towels. I mean, there's some time that goes with it. More than likely, it's gonna, it's gonna take a while, but the, uh, they don't have to shut down for two weeks, no. All right, and the second question is in regards to persons who get COVID-19 from the workplace. I understand that if someone gets COVID from the workplace, it has to be reported to the health department as well as OSHA on the 300A form. My question is, what happens if someone passes uh, due to COVID-19 diagnosis? Uh, I know normally with deaths in the workplace, there can be fines, etc. I have seen that there have been positives in the workplace, but I have not seen a place where the data is being held, nor have I seen any workplace deaths due to COVID this year. 
So employers are required within MyOSHA, and some of these pieces I would encourage that person to give 855 safe c 19 a call and talk with them about some of those processes on reporting, but certainly Federal OSHA put out some guidelines that they do have to put COVID cases on the 300 log. If an employer has a workplace fatality, they're required to notify MyOSHA uh, if, if the cause was the workplace. So if I was if I got COVID-19 because I was at the grocery store and I happened to die from it, that's not going to be a workplace related COVID situation. But the employer does have to make a determination. And uh, if MyOSHA picks up on this, they might inquire as well. Sometimes we've seen media reports on uh, COVID fatalities that'll say, you know, a bus driver dies of COVID. MyOSHA has and will reach out in those cases to those employers and ask them to make a determination. All right. Uh, our next question Is there a time frame on how long you have to keep the health questionnaires on file? Can you just keep two months' work? of the most current? We don't have a specific record keeping requirement and there's two pieces here that I remind everybody all the time, right? We have a public health crisis that impacts workplace safety. And, you know, from, from kind of what we would expect, employers have to be doing health screenings. We're going to need to be able to verify that you're doing those health screenings, but that doesn't mean you need two months or five months or, or 12 months of those forms laying around and just sitting there. I think uh, from an inspection standpoint, I would, I'm surmising a little bit that, you know, we, we're gonna wanna know that you're doing one. We're gonna wanna know that you have done one. Uh, the results of those may or may not be necessary beyond a certain time frame. The incubation period for COVID is about 14 days. So, you know, any data uh, before that about who was infected, not really, not really relevant, right? So, uh, but from a public health, you'd want to check in with your local public health and see if they have some other kind of record keeping requirement. Perfect. All right. A member of the public comes to our office to make a payment and does not go beyond our front lobby. Is this person required to have a face covering to come inside the lobby area? Uh, they also made a note that the front desk worker in the lobby area is shielded by plexiglass. Uh, yes, I mean the the question answers itself. A member of the public comes into our lobby to so obviously that lobby is open to the public. Executive Order 153 requires everyone in an enclosed public space to be wearing a face covering. I would suggest that uh, depending on how your plexiglass is set up, you know if it's like the uh, old school banks where you had the thing you talk through, maybe it'll be a little bit different. But I think you're going to want to be considering a face covering for that employee as well. All right, our next question says, I'm having COVID-19 symptoms or I'm living with someone who tested positive or is having symptoms. Can my, can my employer require me to come to work? Uh, no, the, so the governor extended Michigan's Paid Medical Leave Act under Executive Order 36 and it prohibits uh, retaliation, discipline, and discharge uh, for employees who either have, it, it could be a positive or symptoms of COVID, or are caring for some or, or in close contact with somebody that has or has symptoms of COVID. So uh, if you if you are doing, if you are caring for someone or you have the symptoms yourself, that executive order will pr protect you from retaliation, discipline, or discharge. And if you have an issue with that, you would file a claim with the Michigan Wage and Hour Division. Thank you. All right, we have another anonymous question. It says, how do industries with very warm environments, for example, a manufacturing plant during high humidity and high temp days, uh, how do they help their workers be safe while wearing a mask? Masks restrict oxygen flow and are even worse on extremely hot and humid days. At our plant, we are well spaced to allow the six plus feet between workers. What is the acceptable allowance during hot months? So in the question, the person mentioned that in that work environment, they're able to maintain six feet of separation. So if they're able to do that consistently, the only time that they would be required to wear the face coverings is when they're going to those common areas, the bathrooms, hallways, uh, break rooms, and those places where they're gonna be within that six feet of social distance. 
if folks are working within six feet of social distance, they're going to want to work, talk with their employer about adding fans and other tools there. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers has put out some good information about the claim that masks, now let's use different terms here, masks reduce oxygen. Cloth face coverings, surgical masks, and others uh, do not have an impact on that, but that's, you know, check out their website. They got some information posted there on how that works. Perfect. And our next question states, I'm worried about retaliation from health and safety concerns. Can I file a complaint anonymously? And how can I request an inspection from my OSHA? So any inspections from my OSHA are driven by that complaint. You can't just call and say, hey, come out here, please. You need to file that complaint. The investigators in my OSHA need to know what's happening in that workplace to respond appropriately. The form that you fill out to file a complaint allows you to remain anonymous. You will not be anonymous to the inspector. They need to talk with you about what's happening, uh, but they will not release your name to the employer if you choose not to do that. If there's a checkbox that says, yes, release my name or no, don't release my name. So if you choose don't release my name, your name will be pulled from any of the information. All right, do I have to submit my company's plan to MIOSHA? No, no, the, uh, the plans are required to be available to your employees, customers, uh, regulators like MIOSHA uh, and the general public either uh, somewhere inside the workplace on an internet or on a website. Excellent. And does this workplace safety apply to school employees? Yes, uh, Myosha actually just worked through and posted the K through 12 workplace guidelines that were included in the recently released executive order that applies to K through 12. Now keep in mind in K through 12, there is a strong in all workplaces right now, as I mentioned, there's a very strong public health component to go along with this. The guidelines that MIOSHA are working with are those that impact uh, worker safety in the workplace. Uh, those are up right now, so absolutely yes. All right, what type of written documentation or COVID specific preparedness plan is required for a company? And what are the required elements of such a plan? Oh, you're going to make me recite them off the top of my head. I'll do my best. So uh, if you go to that Michigan COVID workplace safety site and you are a low or medium risk employer, MIOSHA already has a template plan posted there that you can use and work through. It includes categorizing your workers by their risk category. For most Michigan em employers, that's going to be medium or low risk. There are some high or very high. Those are folks that are going to be exposed to known or suspected cases of COVID think more likely treating patients. Dental offices will have some exposure there because of the aerosols that some of their procedures generate. Mortuary workers and others would be in that very high. Most workplaces will be medium or low, so you'd have to do that. Uh, then you'll need to establish uh, engineering controls, which are those physical barriers or HVAC changes or other things to help mitigate the risk. You'll have to consider and implement possible administrative controls. Those are things like staggering shifts, uh, changing break and lunch times, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're going to need to do a, a have a cleaning and sanitization protocol for daily uh, in the office when people get sick and that kind of thing. You're going to need to have a health screening protocol that includes daily health screenings as well as what you do when somebody does come down with the illness. You're going to have to have some record keeping components in there, but uh, anything I might have missed, if you're in a lower medium risk, which is going to be most workplaces, go check out Michigan.gov COVID workplace safety and MIOSHA has built a beautiful template uh, exposure preparedness and response plan that you can utilize and it'll have the pieces in there that you need to be focusing on. All right, Sean has done a great job of plugging our website. Again, that's michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety. Um, with that, our, our time is coming to an end and I encourage everyone to go to that website for more information and keep following us on uh, Facebook for details on the next COVID workplace safety Q&A session. So thanks for that. Anything else you'd like to add, Sean? 
No, thanks everybody. Keep uh, keep tuned. We're gonna keep trying to do these.